Okay, um, so let's just go through the uh, module page. So everyone should be familiar with this first part on the photons and quantum theory. So you finished all of that. Uh, now for my part, I'll be taking the optics part. So that's this first bit here, and then the special relativity part. Okay, that's this bit over here. So currently there's the section called optics, and this is where all of the uh, notes are. Okay, so the past lecturer wrote up some notes and tutorials. You'll find that here. I will also be putting up notes and problems, but that will be in a separate folder. So we, we can keep that separate. And then I've also included this folder here with YouTube videos. So this is what I've gone through for past, um, past explanations and problems and all of that. Uh, so these YouTube channels are really good at explaining things, going through problems, um, and stuff like that. So uh, please make use of these. And then the same thing for relativity. Uh, we see here's all the relativity notes and then the relativity videos from the past lecturer. Uh, please make use of this as well. And then finally, the YouTube videos for relativity. Okay, so here is the lecture series uh, by Leonard Suskin. Okay, so from, uh, he's from Stanford. He has a great lecture series on that. Um, I highly recommend you go through this. I will also be posting shorter YouTube videos uh, going over some of the smaller topics in relativity. Okay, so you can use that as well. Okay, so that's all the notes and stuff. Um, and then as we go through with the material, I will post some of my own notes. Okay, just... Uh, pretty much a transcript of what we cover in the lecture videos. So uh, this is everything that we're going to be doing today and I'll upload that as well. Okay, um, here's the links, you know where that is. And finally, uh, just the semester plan. Okay, so I like planning everything out. Over here, we've got the days, okay, for the semester. And then I've highlighted here where we have our uh, meetups. So optics lecture one, two, three, and four, and five over here. And then you write your quiz. It's highlighted in red here. And then we have special relativity one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then you have your relativity quiz. Okay, so that's just uh, the, the days that we have. And then this right hand column here, this is just um, a rough guide of what you should be going through yourself. Okay, so we only meet up twice a week. So the rest of the time you're on your own looking through the notes and videos, uh, but this is a rough guide of what you should be doing in those weeks. So for this first week, you know, we go through the beginning part, nature of light, reflection, refraction, stuff like that. And then you've got your break. Um, and then we have the following week, you should be going through this stuff and then the following week and so on. And then here for week 11, we start relativity. So you should be going through this stuff um, and so on. So if you follow this guide, you should finish on time. Okay, so you'll cover everything uh, by the time we get to the quiz. But of course you can move at your own pace. So uh, maybe you want, you want to cover um, some of this during the break, you can do that. Um, but just make sure that, you know, we get through everything at the end. Okay, so this is just a rough guide um, of the stuff we need to cover. Uh, then just a note on the special relativity part. So your lecture notes um, on relativity, they're a bit old. Okay, so I wanted to update them a bit uh, with a bit more, uh, a bit more stuff that you should be going through. Okay, but of course your quiz will only cover you know, the stuff in the notes and the videos and stuff. Okay, so I'm not, not gonna test you on anything, um, you know, that's not set for the syllabus. Okay, but there are a few things extra that I want to go through. And that's um, the proper use of Lorentz transformations. Okay, that's gonna sound meaningless to you now, but you'll see when we get there, uh, we'll go through that. Hyperbolic geometry in Minkowski space and velocity and rapidity. Uh, these are important things for special relativity, but they're not covered in your notes. So um, I'm going to be adding to that. Okay, and then right at the end, just a few problems to go through with special relativity. Uh, that's particle decay. So um, in Newtonian mechanics, 
if you have a particle, you can't really describe one particle turning into other particles. That, that doesn't make sense. But if you include special relativity, uh, then that is now possible. So we'll be looking at that. And we will also be looking at magnetism as a result of special relativity. Okay, so that's a little extra thing that we will go through. Okay, um, are there any questions so far on the semester plan? Okay, so if you do have questions, please just shout out if you need to. I don't mind being interrupted like that. Uh, or if you don't want to shout out, uh, then you can just type in the chat and then I can have a look at those messages. Okay, but please interrupt me the moment you're confused. Don't wait, you know, until I'm finished the whole chapter and then say, please go back to the beginning, I'm confused. Okay, I'd rather fix any issues um, right as they come up. Okay, um, and I really don't mind going over the same thing three or four times. Uh, you know, if, if you want to ask the same question three times before you get it, uh, please go ahead and do that. Okay, so any questions about this plan and the study guide that I have here? Okay, uh, one more boring thing before we get started with the lecture, and that is the WhatsApp group. So over here, I've put the link to the WhatsApp group. Just click that and you'll be added to the group. Uh, that is where I will be posting extra questions and uh, announcements. I'll also be posting announcements via email so you won't miss out if you don't want to join the group. Uh, but the group is there if you have any other questions throughout the week. So we only meet twice a week, but of course you're going to have problems during the week. Uh, so this is where you post your uh, questions. Okay, and then I'll try answer as quickly as possible. Okay, so just post them there. Uh, maybe some other classmates can answer it before me, uh, but then at the end of the day, I'll always check um, to see that the correct stuff is being posted there. Okay, but that's on the class WhatsApp group. Okay, that's it for the boring admin stuff. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Okay, cool. Um, if you do have any questions later on, please just um, either email me or if it's a problem with a tutorial or homework or understanding, uh, please post it to the WhatsApp group. Okay, and then I can answer there. Okay, but if there's no questions now, let's get started with the lecture. Okay, so since we're only meeting twice, what I would like to do is have the first lecture, so that would be the Tuesday, is to go over theory, um, you know, the stuff that we should be covering for the week, so just uh, an introduction to that, and maybe some problems so that you can then do the problems during the week. And then on Friday, which is the end of the week uh, where we meet again, uh, we go through more problems and maybe answer some uh, questions that you have, uh, that, that you've written down throughout the week. Yeah, so that's how I would like to use these Zoom meetings. But if you want to use them in a different way, Maybe you want Tuesday to be only problems and Friday to be only theory. You know, we can work something out. Okay. So it's up to you how we use these sessions. Okay, so let's start off with light rays and geometric optics. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is where does light come from? Okay, so there's a number of ways of going through this. You can look at it from the quantum mechanical point of view, classical point of view, you know, with electricity and magnetism. Uh, we're going to look at that classical view. Okay, so everyone should be familiar with photons and the quantum mechanical view now. So in the previous module, uh, when you looked at electricity and magnetism, you saw that changing electric fields can induce magnetic fields. Okay, that was one of the laws we went through. And also we saw that changing magnetic fields induce electric fields. So it goes both ways. 
So we summarize this idea um, with two of Maxwell's equations. So we have one, which is del cross E is equal to minus D by DT B. And the second one is del cross B is equal to J plus D by DT of E. Okay, don't worry about all the funny symbols and the calculus, uh, you'll cover that later on. But the important thing to, to realize here is that we have an electric field and a magnetic field. Okay, the changing magnetic field causes the electric field and the changing electric field can cause a magnetic field. Okay, that's the key idea that you, that you should take away from this. Okay, so why is this important? Well, because if these two fields are inducing each other, then what we can get is a self-propagating wave. So using one and two can be used to show that these E and B fields, sorry, these E and B fields can produce a self-propagating wave. Okay, so you know with sound, if you clap your hands, it's going to disturb the air and that's going to move forward as a sound wave. However, that is not self-propagating. You need some source, you clapping your hands, to make the disturbance that will then propagate as a sound wave. However, in this case, we see that the parts of the wave, the E and the B fields, they make up the wave, they cause each other. And that gives us the self-propagating uh, nature of the wave. So we end up with the following picture. We've got this wave in the electric field and we've got this wave in the magnetic field and they propagate along in some direction. Let's say that way. So let's say vertically, we have the electric field oscillating and horizontally, we have the magnetic field oscillating. Okay, and they oscillate and this wave will then move to the right. Okay, we say that this is the direction of propagation. Yeah, so we can study the motion of this wave, which we call light. So a propagating electromagnetic wave, we just call light. Okay, so it doesn't have to be visible. You know, X-rays, gamma rays, microwaves, all of that we consider as light. Uh, we want to study the propagation of these waves. So instead of looking at it in terms of electric fields and magnetic fields, we use the so-called geometric optic limit. In other words, we know the wave is going from left to right. We ignore the fact that it's made of electric and magnetic fields, and we just draw a line or a vector to represent the motion. In other words, light goes in a straight line. Let's just view it as a straight line. And we call this a light ray. Okay, so from this wave nature to a very simplified view as a light ray, we call this the geometric optic limit. Okay, now this idea of a geometric optic limit is not um, just for these light rays, it's used in other areas of physics where you take this complicated thing and you make it simpler like we've done here with this light ray. Yeah, that, that's the idea of geometric optic limit. So instead of looking at it in terms of fields, we look at it in terms of geometry, because we know that it's going to move in a straight line, and we know how to deal with that in terms of geometry. Okay, so we're going to be working with these light rays instead of working with E and B fields. Okay, so the idea is looking at well, how do these light rays interact with things? If this light ray hits the surface, what happens? If it bounces off something, what happens? 
those are the things we're going to be looking at. In other words, uh, we are interested in the scattering of light rays. Okay, so what happens to these light rays as they bounce around and hit things? Okay, just as a little side note, uh, this whole theory of light rays and scattering um, is used a lot in computer science in terms of the visual things with computer science, especially in these latest games with ray tracing and stuff like that. So this is used heavily um, in those fields. Okay, so it's not just some simple uh, physics concept, it's quite useful um, in things like that. Okay, so let's look at a picture uh, that encompasses these ideas of scattering. So imagine we have some kind of surface, okay, uh, which we call an interface. Okay, and this will be the boundary between two materials. So let's say the top material is air and the bottom one is glass, for example. And then between the two surfaces, we have some kind of interface, something like that. Uh, the question is, if we have an incoming light ray, what happens to it? So we've got an incoming light ray doing this. Okay, now the idea is that this light ray is going to split into two parts. Some of this light ray is going to be reflected. So it's going to be reflected like this. And some of it is going to be transmitted or refracted. And it's going to end up like that. Okay, this is the scattering of the light ray. Some of it scatters off as a reflection, some of it scatters through, and we call that a refraction. So this light ray coming in is called the incident ray. The one reflecting off, we call the reflected ray. And the one that goes through, we call that the refracted ray. Okay, now just to add a bit of geometry to the picture so that we can work with things, uh, we have the special line that is perpendicular to the interface. We call that the normal line. Yeah, so if you have a, a 2D surface and you have a line that is perpendicular to the surface, like if you have your table and you hold your pen straight up on the table, uh, we say that is normal to the table. Okay, and that will help with the geometry that we're going to get to. Okay, so we have the incident ray coming in, it scatters, some of it is scattered off as a reflected ray, some of it is scattered through as a refracted ray. And we want to work out if we know the angle of incidence, this angle over here, angle of incidence, can we work out the other angles of the scattered rays? Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. So let's take a look at the first thing. That is this top portion with incidence and reflected. Okay, so we call that reflection. Okay, so what happens with reflection? So again, we've got our interface. Okay, now I'm only focused on the reflection part. We'll get to the refraction later on. Okay, so we've got the light ray coming in, the light ray coming out. We've got the normal to help us with the geometry. The ray coming in, that's incident. And the ray coming out, that's reflected. Okay, we measure this angle as the incident angle and this angle as the reflected angle. So what is the relationship between these two angles? Okay, we wanna work that out. Okay, so the relationship between this incident ray and this reflected ray um, can be derived uh, using the electric fields and the magnetic fields and the so-called boundary conditions. So, we have electric slash magnetic fields at the top. Okay, so at the top of the interface, there's an electric and magnetic field as it touches the surface. 
we also have electric and magnetic fields at the bottom. Okay, so we've got electric magnetic fields at the top. So the wave at the top uh, going into the surface and then the waves going through the surface. Now, we're not gonna go through the whole derivation now. You, you will cover that later on. Uh, but basically these things called boundary conditions. In other words, like the electric field, um, it can't just jump from the top surface to the bottom there needs to be some kind of continuity with the electric field. And the same with the magnetic field, there needs to be some kind of continuity. You can't just have a wave coming in and then the wave coming off at some random angle. Okay, there needs to be some continuity. We call those the boundary conditions. From these boundary conditions, we get the laws of reflection. Okay, so if you are interested in what these boundary conditions are, I can explain it on the WhatsApp group, uh, but that will be covered later on okay, in, in another module. Okay, so using those, we get the laws of reflection. What are these laws of reflection? Well, the first one is that the incident, the incident ray, the normal line, and the reflected ray all lie in the same plane. Okay, so what does that mean for these three things to lie in the same plane? Uh, let's just draw a random plane in 3D space, something like that. Okay, so we have X, Y, and Z in 3D space. We have some plane cutting through. For all of these to lie in the same plane, it means that if this is our point of incidence, then the ray coming in, the ray going out, and the normal are all in this plane. So it's not like we have the incident ray coming through and then the reflected ray comes out of the plane. Okay, we don't have that. Everything is in line with each other in the same plane. Okay, that's one of the laws. Um, any questions about that? Okay, and then number two, the second law is the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Okay, so if we go back to our picture, this angle going in, the theta r and the theta r, those are identical. So we can write that as theta r. Okay, so that is the two laws of reflection, which we can get from the so-called boundary conditions of the electric and magnetic fields. Again, if you are interested in where those come from, uh, please ask me on the group, uh, but we are only interested in these results. Okay, and the results are the two laws of reflection. Okay, so we have these two here. Okay, the next thing to go through is refraction. So remember, we only looked at this top part of the picture. There's that bottom part, where some of the light gets transmitted through. So we wanna look at that. So the next thing is refraction or the transmission of this light. So again, we've got the surface, which we call the interface because it's between two, uh, two media. We've got our normal line that's perpendicular. We have our incident ray and the reflected ray, and we've covered this, we know that they go at the same angle. So if this is theta r, then this is theta i as well. Okay, and then we also have this transmitted ray going like this, and it has its own angle. 
something like that. So the idea is that this incident ray doesn't take the same path that it came from. So if we continue this line, it should be doing that. However, it gets bent. Now, the reason it gets bent is because the light changes speed from one medium to another. So if we say this top is medium one and this bottom is medium two, in medium one, it has some velocity V1, whatever it may be. In medium two, it has some velocity V2. Because remember, this is just a wave. A wave has some velocity and depending on the medium, it has a different velocity. Okay, so this change in velocity from medium one to medium two causes a change in the direction. We have the light being bent. Now, this degree of bending is described by the so-called index of refraction. So the degree of bending is described by the index of refraction. Okay, so you can think of refraction means the light is bending. The index of refraction just gives us a number as to how much it's actually bending. And the way that we define this index of refraction is n is equal to the speed of light in the vacuum. So just passing through empty space uh, or to a good approximation passing through air and the velocity in the medium V. Okay, the ratio between these velocity, the, the ratio between these velocities give us a unitless number called the index of refraction. Okay, so if the index of refraction is one, then the light will just move in a straight line because it's just moving through air or a vacuum. If the index of refraction is greater than one, you're going to have some kind of bending in the light ray. Okay, so we want to look at this degree of bending. In other words, how can we predict what this angle is going to be here? Okay, so that's the whole idea of refraction. Okay, uh, but before we get to that, we're gonna do a little tangent uh, because different materials can have a different index of refraction. For example, air has an index of refraction of one, a uh, diamond might have something like four as its index of refraction. But also, if you consider one material, the index of refraction could also depend on the wavelength of the light. So in a given material, it's now we're not, we're not looking at two materials with different indices of, of refraction, we're looking at one material. So in a given material, the index of refraction could depend on the wavelength. Um, in other words, it could depend on the color of the light. Because remember, uh, the wavelength of the light determines what color we see it as. And of course, if it's x-rays or microwaves, you can't see what it is, but you can still assign a wavelength to it. Okay, we call this dispersion. Okay, so the fact that the index of refraction could depend on wavelength, we call that dispersion. Okay, so the classic example of dispersion is looking at a prism. So let's say we've got a prism like this. We have white light coming through. Let's say something like that. So remember what white light is, is just all of the frequencies or all of the wavelengths uh, traveling together. So we have all of the colors traveling parallel. So they make up white light ray coming in. Now, this material has a certain index of refraction, but it depends on the wavelength. So we have N depends on lambda. And this will then cause different amounts of bending. Because remember, the index of refraction describes how much the light is bent. Okay, so here we have that the light is bent by different amounts depending on its color. 
So it gets bent uh, going into the prism, it's get bent going out of the prism. And we have the following picture. Something like that. Now let's just add a bit of color. So the red light, okay, in, in, in this case, it could be different for other materials, but in this case, red light is bent the least. So it's going to be very close to the original path because it's bent very little. Then we might have orange or yellow light. That would be something like there. Uh, green lights would be somewhere here. And blue light, this is bent the most, that would be somewhere here. So you can see how the blue light has the largest uh, bending as it exits the prism. So from here going down, we have red. Okay, so that's the longest wavelength orange, slightly less, yellow, green, and blue. Shortest wavelength gets bent the most. Now, just from this picture, you can see that the result is a rainbow. Okay, so if we imagine this not as a prism, but we look at a water droplet and how that uh, refracts light, then the outgoing light rays are dispersed, hence dispersion, so it's dispersed, from red to blue, like this, um, and that's how we get the, the rainbow. Okay, so white light goes in, it gets split up based on the wavelength or dispersed based on the wavelength, and we get the following picture. Okay, so uh, this morning I emailed everyone with a couple YouTube videos uh, just on, you know, some things to watch. One of those videos was explaining where rainbows come from. Uh, it follows this idea here. And it goes through all the maths um, involved. Okay, so that's a little tangent on uh, refraction where it could depend on the wavelength. Okay, so you need to keep that in mind. Uh, so we will just be looking at uh, uh, substances where it doesn't depend on the wavelength, uh, but you do have to keep this in mind that it could. Okay, so let's go back to our original problem of finding what is this angle theta over here? Okay, so how can we go about finding that? Well, Fermat can help us out because he has this uh, principle called Fermat's principle of least time. Okay, we're gonna be using that to derive the formula. In your notes, there is another derivation using Huygens principle, okay? But it's very good to look at multiple derivations of the same thing. Okay, it gives you more insights. So this is Fermat's principle of least time. And we will see this idea come up later on in special relativity. So um, it's not only used in this case. So what is this principle? It states that lots will take the least amount of time to travel, so at least amount of time to travel from point A to point B. Okay, yeah, that's Fermat's principle. Okay, so lots as it is, it's a physical thing, it will take the least amount of time to travel from point A to point B, um, no matter where these points are. So what we can do is use this idea with the picture that we had of an interface and light being refracted. Okay, because remember, this can be applied everywhere. So let's apply it to our problem. So we've got our interface. At the top, we have medium one air, water, glass, whatever. At the bottom, we have medium two. Again, air, water, glass, it doesn't matter. So what we want is a light ray coming in. Again, there's the normal, there's the reflected. Okay, the reflected isn't very interesting because we know it has the same angle. So if this is theta one, then this is theta one. But what we are interested in is this theta two. Okay, we're trying to work out what that is. Okay, so what we're going to do is look at this picture and use the idea of this least time 
to figure out what this angle needs to be. So if this top part here, if it starts from point A and goes to point B, let's say the origin there is O, then the time taken to go from A to O and then from O to B should be a minimum, least amount of time. Okay, that's the idea. So let's just uh, draw in a couple of lines, put in some variables so we can work this out. So let's say that this vertical distance here is A. Let's say this vertical distance here is B. The total distance between A and B, let's call that Y. The distance from A to the origin, let's call that X, which means this distance over here from the origin to B going horizontally is going to be Y minus X. Okay, so we, we've labeled everything now, we can use that. So what is the total time T to go from A to B? Well, first, the light ray needs to go from A to O. How quickly does it go from A to O? It's going to be the distance divided by the velocity. So it's going to be AO divided by the velocity. Since it is in region one or medium one, let's call that velocity V1. Next, the light needs to go from O to B. What is the time taken to go from O to B? It's going to be OB over V2. That's the total time. Now, with a bit of Pythagoras, we can work out this length AO and the length OB. We can substitute it in, and we get some function of T with respect to X. Okay, this variable X here. Okay, everything else is constant. X can change. So we end up with a function t of x. Now, we want to minimize the time. So what we do is we have dt by dx is equal to 0. That's how we find the minimum of things. We take the derivative. We set it equal to 0. This I'm going to leave as homework. Okay, so during the lectures or during the week, I will post some homework problems. You can give them a go. And then in the evening, I will post the solutions on the WhatsApp group. Okay, so that gives you some time to go through it. So, uh, so with this diagram over here, find AO using Pythagoras, find OB using Pythagoras, uh, take the derivative with respect to X, set it equal to zero. Okay, see what you get. And the result, once you've done all of that, will be n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. In other words, we get Snell's law. Okay. Now, how did we get this n over here? Okay, we, we have no n in the diagram. So how did we get it here? Well, recall that n is equal to C over B. That's how we introduce it over there. Okay, so give this a go as homework. See if you can re-derive this. And then we end up with Snell's law. So Snell's law tells us how to predict the refracted angle based on the incident angle. In other words, we know N1 and we know N2. Those are just properties of the material. We know theta one because that's the incident angle. We can calculate theta two. So we can calculate slash predict the refracted angle. Yeah, and that's what we use Snell's law for is to predict what, what this refracted angle is supposed to be. Okay, um, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, this is just another way of obtaining Snell's law. Uh, the previous lecturer has a derivation using Huygens principle. You get exactly the same thing, uh, but I think it's really good to have multiple perspectives on the same thing. So. You can go via Huygens principle and get Snell's law, or you can go via this approach, uh, which we call a variational approach. 
because we're trying to minimize uh, this time for the light ray. And we also get Snell's law. So a completely different approach, we get the same thing. Okay, and that's, that's pretty surprising in physics when, when you have this, um, you know, multiple perspectives on the same thing. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Okay, no questions. Okay, so next time we will carry on with this. Okay, so, um, you know, throughout the week, you go through the problems. Uh, I will post more lecture notes, um, you know, as we go through. Uh, next time we will carry on with this geometric optics. Uh, but please take a look at the notes. Um, I've added some more stuff here that we didn't cover today. Um, and that is what happens when light goes through uh, medium where the first medium has a higher refractive index or where the first medium has a lower refractive index. You know, certain interesting things happened there. Okay, also the critical angle and the idea of total internal reflection. Okay, that's all in the notes for you to go through. Okay, uh, but later on today, I will post the full derivation um, of Snell's law using this idea of least time. Uh, but you should try it out yourself first, you know, see if you can get it, uh, and then you can have a look at those solutions. Okay, and then throughout the week, I will post more problems, more notes for you to go through, and then on Friday, uh, we will carry on with, um, uh, with the next section. Okay, so um, are there any questions about this lecturing structure or the Zoom sessions or anything like that? Okay, so just once again, uh, the two Zoom sessions will be used to go through uh, maybe some very important things, okay, or go through some problems. And then for the remainder of the week, um, you know, you're going to be going through the work by yourself. Well, not entirely by yourself. Of course, you have the WhatsApp group. You can always answer questions um, if you have any. Okay, I'll see you on Friday. Bye, everyone.